Good afternoon. My name is Todd Stoll. I'm the Vice President for Education at Jazz at Lincoln Center. I want to welcome everyone to our 26th annual Essentially Ellington Competition and Festival. Uh, for the second year in a row, we are online. Um, we're glad you all can join us. We have uh, students and directors from our 15 finalist schools with us on Zoom and our audience throughout the world joining us through uh, our website, jazz.org backslash ee, or on social media on our Facebook pages. I'd like to thank a few supporters who have been instrumental in keeping this program uh, going all of these years. Founding leadership support for Essentially Ellington is provided by the Jack and Susan Rudin Educational and Scholarship Fund and Gail and Alfred Engelberg. We would also like to thank the Augustine Foundation and the Charles Evans Hughes Memorial Fund for their longstanding support of the program. So welcome everybody. Uh, so the way this is gonna work today, uh, we're gonna use the raise hand feature. I'm sure students know the raise hand feature on Zoom as they have been doing this for uh, well over 14 months, uh, but it's under the reaction button at the bottom of the page. Um, if you will raise your hand, we'll try to get to everyone in order as best we can. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce the Managing and Artistic Director of Jazz at Lincoln Center, uh, Mr. Winton Marcellus. Mr. Marcellus. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being on. As always, it's an honor and pleasure for me to, uh, to address you. And I always say no question is too serious or too trivial, it doesn't matter. I'll do my best to answer you as honestly as I can, with, with, with all the experience I have, I try to tell you stories so that it's not too boring. And uh, I want to say that as we get into really serious questions about our country and the nature of things, I want to say that I have a perspective. I don't have an answer. These are very, very complex, nuanced issues. And there's um, there, there are a lot of ways. There are, a lot of, there are many, many roads can lead to a, a solution. I have a perspective that I, I have and I'm willing to give to you, but I'm also willing to listen to yours. And I really look forward to see what our younger generations achieve. The one thing that I am confident about is the value of mutual productivity. The talking is great. It's, it's important to talk about issues and to be honest, but even more importantly, it's important to do things together and let the quality of our mutual work, let's let that prove what we have to say. I wanna say that Mr. Stoll and I met each other. I'm a little older than him, even though I, I look much younger. I'm, I'm older, I'm two or three years older than him. When I met him, I was maybe 25 or 26. I don't know, he was 21 or 22. And we've had a, a relationship with each other around music and playing. We've discussed very serious issues. We've been through many life things. <laughs> there are so many things, dumb things, do to our own doing and are some that have been foisted upon us. This is the nature of life. We've had parents die on us, many things. And we've dealt with, as I'm sure many of you, your parents and certainly your grandparents have. Uh, There's nothing new under the sun. So as much as we can use our experience to illuminate things for you, we want to do that. And when you see us work together, you see us two old guys. I see old DT is on there. Some of our Jazz and Lincoln Center staff, we work with each other all the time. And we're very matter of fact about the things that we do. And I will speak to you all uh, with an adult perspective, but as someone who has kids and is the age of, could have grandkids, but I'm not gonna old man y'all. I'm gonna take what you have to say very seriously because these are serious times as all times are serious. So with that, I'm not gonna belabor it. And if I, if I start to give too long answers, I'm gonna ask Mr. Stoll to please cut in and abridge my, my answer so that we can get to more questions. Thank you all so much. It's an honor and pleasure. Thank you, uh, Winton. Uh, we are going to start with a question from Carly Arnold. Uh, if the students can then, when we're asked you, unmute yourself, say your name, the school you're from, maybe the grade you're in. You can even say what instrument you play. Uh, but let's start with Carly Arnold. Hi, I'm, I'm Carly Arnold. I go to Byron Center. Um, I play the alto saxophone I'm here next year. Um, so my question is, how could somebody like me at least attempt to fairly represent the soul of certain songs where I can't understand the, like fully at least understand the perspective of what they're writing? Well, that, that's why we study, Carly. You know, when I first, uh, I'm gonna take myself back to when I was 12 or 13 years old, 
a guy gave me a, a, an album of a great French trumpet player named Maurice Andre. And I, I was disappointed because it was classical music. Man, this dude gave me some classical music. I turned the album over and I started to read the liner notes and it said that the man's parents were coal miners. Now, was I a coal miner? I'm from New Orleans. We don't, we don't have coal miners in New Orleans. Was I French? No. But I said, man, if somebody's parents could be coal miners and they could learn how to play a classical trumpet, let me put this music on. So the man's experiences allowed me to overcome my own ignorance and prejudice. I put the record on. Whew, man, he could play. I said, I wonder if I could learn how to play like this guy. I pulled my trumpet out and started to play, take stuff off the recordings like we did. Not because I didn't know music was available, but hey, the Haydn trumpet concerto, I'm trying to get my vibrato like his, trying to do this. I became a fan of him, Maurice Andre. Then, but Maurice Andre is French. Haydn is not from France. Then I started to understand international connections. Now let's think about soul for a second. And I'm gonna leave y'all with a thought. If I can see your face, I can identify you. Oh, that's Carly, okay, I know you. Now, if they only showed me a skeleton of you, Maybe I could go by your height, or maybe it's you know, something I could. If they started to show me organs, a heart, a liver, lungs, blood vessels, I'm, I'll know it's a human being, but you're gonna have a lot more in common with most people. Now, let's get down to the soul level. The soul level, we're all exactly the same. Spirit is one. That's part of the trick of a body. It's part of the trick of humanity. In humanity, you are individualized. In the soul, you are one. That's kind of a complex concept, but it's not that complex. Okay, so anybody can touch the soul of anything if they want to do that. But you can't do it without studying and understanding. There's, there, there's so many human perspectives in art. You can read a Greek, you can read the Iliad. And when Hector goes to, to uh, fight Achilles, you think, boy, this is going to be a good fight. And you're shocked when Hector starts to run. Well, I could go through any number of stories that they transcend uh, whatever we categorize ourselves as. So believe me, you seem to be quite soulful just from me looking at you. I, I can only tell what I tell. You seem to have a great deal of humanity. You ask a question about soul and humanity. That means you're interested in it and you identify with it. That a person has to have a certain type of experience to have access to soul and to humanity. That is an inaccurate way of perceiving what, what human beings are. We're all living lives out here. Okay, does that, have, does that make sense? You, you muted, but I know you said something nice. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So and that, the other side of what I'm telling you and I'm gonna conclude is that that means none of us are relieved of the responsibility of doing something because we aren't something. You know, I'm talking to a great German trumpet player played in the Berlin Philharmonic for many years. And he's telling me about the fantastic lessons he had with a Russian trumpet teacher. Is he telling me, man, you know, too bad he was Russian. I couldn't figure out what he was saying. <laughs> saying, man, let me tell you how Doug Schitzer would do us or what he would tell us. So, you know, mm. that's, that's what I'm telling you. All right, let's go to Nate Cook from Noblesville. Indiana, Noblesville High School. I think your whole band's there in the band room with you, right, Nate? Yeah. Okay. What's happening, Nate? <laughs> What's up? Um, so I read your blog post that was a response to the murder of George Floyd. You mentioned the fake construct of blackness in America um, and how it's been used to degrade black Americans for centuries. Um, you also mentioned how the construct uh, is really hard to get rid of, and we probably can't have a post-racial America where race doesn't matter. Um, if we can't fully move on from being a racial society in America, how can we uh, celebrate and lift up blackness uh, so that black Americans be, can uh, achieve equality uh, with the rest of America? Well, there's many different things that we're covering in one, one, one thing. Now, what's difficult with things like this is that the tendency is we're going to conflate all the issues and make them be one. If you, if you look at racial laws, and rules, there, there's a good book I'm going to recommend to you all first. It, it's a serious book, and it's a research book, so it's not easy reading, and it's not going to give you the Google a soundbite. 
It's by a woman named Christina Proenza Coles, C-O-L-E-S. It's unbelievably well-researched. And uh, it's, it's called American Founders. Our nation is very complex. It is an extreme, uh, a history of great heroism and the opposite of heroism. And what you can do to hold up what the concept of blackness as you see it is to develop heroes that are of any kind of race. Like if I'm talking to you, now I'm not only referring to black people, right? We talked about Haydn, we talked about Maurice Andre, we talked about Timothy Duchess, uh, we talked about, we'll talk about a lot of people. And in the course of this conversation, I'm gonna talk to you about things that my great mentors gave me, my father. Of course, I grew up in de facto segregation. So I want you to understand where I'm coming from. We lived on the black side of a small town outside of New Orleans behind the second set of railroad tracks between the railroad tracks and the river. And then there was no integration. It was like, man, you know, you were in your lane. And uh, life has taught me many things, very different from what I thought even when I was 18 and moved to New York, because I felt that the North would be a Mecca. It was a heaven and the South was the drag. Then when I got to the North, <laughs> man, they had another lesson in store for me that I'm still learning. But I wanna say that I'm gonna go back to the idea that I gave you about mutual productivity and understand that black and white people have lived a life in America. And many times a person we call black is black and every, all kind of other stuff. And when I say the fake construct struct of black, what I mean by this, there's nothing scientific about it. There's a great national geographic that has two twins on the cover. I'm sorry, I don't, I mean, they have a set of twins on the cover and one is black and one is white. And that, I forget the article, but I'm sure it's easy to find. You could just Google it. If you read that article, it's gonna make you understand something about this construct. So I think, try to understand how much is constructed and how much of American mythology is based on. It. And then in many ways, we have to counteract those aspects of the, of the mythology that keep us, keep us from going forward in a productive way. And uh, those parts of the mythology that allow us to be productive in our dealings with one another, we have to try to work on that part of mythology. Now, what I say to all of my younger people is do something constructive with people that don't look like you. And if you're in an area that does not have black people, then let it be the other, whoever people don't like. The first time I knew there was a difference between, I went to school with, when Martin Luther King was killed, we were, we, my mother made us go to school with white kids. Man, we didn't want to do that. And it went, it was hard and it went down hard. But I can remember just, we were outside of everything that went on. Now it's not the kids fault. They growing up with the values their parents had. But I remember noticing they said something bad about a Jewish kid. They called him a name. I didn't know what it was. Because of black people where I was from, we didn't know there were different types of white people. So I remember going to the Jewish kid and said, man, they called you this name. And he said, well, man, that's because I'm Jewish. I said, damn, what, what does, you mean like in the Bible? Right? So my worldview was not broad enough. And he went on to explain in his way, he was just a kid, 11 years old or something, to explain why people would be prejudiced against him. Man, I thought it was crazy. I went home and told my mama that, you know, man, this guy said such, 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 such. And she said, you know, people always find a reason to hate. She went through her thing. And he invited me to his home. Man, we never went on white people's side of the, of the of the of the tracks but i said to my brother i said man i'm gonna ride my back over the my bike over to ruben's house he said man you gotta be careful i said no nah, no nah, i'm gonna go in the eat so i went to their house man this mama was so nice and cool and okay was it we had all kind of stuff we would say man white people's house smell different or you know when people when you don't know who people are you got your thing so i i, I talked to the to the man his mama was extremely kind that's the thing i remember i went back i told my brother man his mama is cool did that keep all the rest of the kids from calling him that name? Did it make me, me and him work closer, but was, how was I going to help him? Man, he had a lot to deal with for himself. I'm not going to tell you what I had to deal with. And I remember a, lady, a, a girl coming to the school once, and she was not prejudiced like the other white students. And I said, why are you not prejudiced as the, as the other kids? She said, oh, I'm from Kansas. We hate Indians there. So now this is 1969, 1970, 71. So I want to put y'all in time and space. And through my life, I've learned being in people's homes all over the world, when you get in a certain environment, man, there's some groups that people are prejudiced against and they've determined some set of characteristics that these people have. Because I'm a black American, many times when I go to other countries, people just assume I'm going to be against white Americans. 
And I have to always say, you know, uh, it's very rude for you to have me in your home and force me to go against my own family. I am an American. And that's how I face the world when I go towards it. I'll fight with people in my country. I'll criticize my country. I'll do all of those things. But I don't want to go to other people's country and then be scapegoated into insulting my country because they have their own problems. And the same person is telling you to insult X when you touch on the group they don't like. <laughs> They're very clear about why they don't like them. Okay? In America, we're much less clear about it. We have to rely on movies and TV shows and all of these things to reinforce these prejudices of, of music videos. These things are not true, but we sell that to our kids. So I'm giving you a long answer. I asked Mr. Stoll to cut me off. He didn't do it. <laughs> I was giving I'm you a, I'm going to end by saying, do something productive that puts you into contact with other people, and then you will get a chance to see who they are, and you're going to learn something about them. I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, thank you for Okay, I look for what do you play? Uh, my name's Nate. I play alto sax, and I'll okay, be a I Well, I wish you were a trumpet player, son. <laughs> I like the question. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. We're going to go to Kylan Jones. Kylan? Hello. My name is Kylan Jones from Memphis Central High School. I play trumpet, and I'm a senior this year. And my question is geared towards the conversation that you had with your daughter in the um, George Floyd essay. And you essentially said that cops, that um, corrupt cops, they enjoy killing people that look like me. And I just wanted to know why, um, like why does the mainstream media hide the fact that these corrupt cops don't like the they don't like people like me. Like, why do they hide the fact that they're racist in okay. the mainstream media? Okay, let, 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 no, that's good, man. But let's talk about it and be for real about it. Let's say if you took a pool of cops and it was 50,000 cops, how many of them are gonna kill somebody? It's not gonna be 40, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be 40,000. If you look at the media, you think that. Understand something about the mainstream media. They're trying to make money. Okay, absorb that. Now, what's going to make more money? I'm on this call with you. If I address you with some love and some respect, think about if I right now started just cussing you out and cussing at people and acting a fool. Man, that boy, this would go viral in a second. Man, look at this dude. Look how, look how crazy this guy is. Or look what he did. Anything that can be used to exacerbate a negative or bad situation. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have too much police violence, but I'm going to let you explain something to you. From a percentage wise, there are more blacks being killed by police officers. But I want you to also understand that there are a lot of whites unjustly killed by police officers, too. OK, but that's that's not going to be in the mainstream media. Now I want to leave you with this. A vast majority of police officers will not ever kill an unarmed citizen. That's just like somebody looks at you and say, oh man, black people commit crimes. Man, you realize I've been hearing that since 1969 or seven? I am committed a crime against nobody. None of my friends have done it. Black people commit crime. So when you, when you lump people into a group and you're then able to identify that group and give them your characteristic, then you search for behaviors that go with your stereotype of them. Now, I will tell you, one of my best friends in the world is a Chicago City policeman. I was the best man at his wedding 35 years ago, okay? He's now, he trained police officers for many years, and now he is retired. And he and I have argued over all of these police killings, man, for so many years. And he's a cop in the worst area of Chicago, West Chicago. So I, I was supposed to do an article maybe five or six years ago about uh, uh, Ferguson and the murders there. I was going to interview him. We started to talk. And he always defends officers. Oh, man, you don't know. you civilians. Y'all not out on the street. Y'all don't know what we have to deal with. We talked about all this stuff. And at the end, I said, well, okay. Okay, Officer Parker, how many people have you killed? You in West Chicago? And he said, well, I ain't killed none. I said, why? He said, I didn't want to kill none. Then I started to laugh. And he started laughing when he realized power is something. His son is a police officer. When I went to the police to his graduation, man, the oath officers have to take when they carry weapons is such a serious oath. Not all of these things are true. However, understand the power of corruption. Man, corruption is powerful. 
and I'm going to submit something to you and to show you how subtle and easy it is to be corrupt. When I was in high school, man, we never had a single record with a curse word on it. The Isley Brothers came out with one record called Fight the Power, the first curse word you heard on a record. <laughs> man, what about now? I remember when they started making movies celebrating pimps. Man, my mama hated that. Oh, man, we couldn't wait to go see every movie that had a pimp in it. Oh, man, what the mag? What's this next one? Any kind of stereotype negative about Black folks, we were just going to gobble and eat all of that up. That's corruption. When somebody grows up with, let's look at all of what's going on out here. Man, there's so much corruption in our system that it will make you think that, it's, that don't confuse the corruption in the system with the system. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so don't confuse the fact that I am a, a, a government official who's stealing money and giving my friends kickbacks with democracy is messed up. Mm -hmm. Don't confuse the fact that, that you and I may not uh, pursue our rights and do all we can to make sure that this system is right and right things and get out and protest. Don't confuse that with, man, this system is messed up. We have to participate in these things and create change. And we have to also understand, always separate those who are committing crimes from those who are not committing crimes. So when you say cops, automatically, that's like somebody tells me, white people abuse us or black people abuse us. I go back to that playground with them kids telling me Jews do this. Well, what Jews are you talking about? You know, who are you talking about? My daddy used to always say, who somebody is, is always more important than what they are. So y'all need to, I want you to have a broader language and I want you to understand that we need to fight corruption and policing and we need to fight for changes in policing. And just like we have to, we have to, they have a lot of things in place, the union, grand jury, all of these things can be changed with the right type of civic action. And civic action is much more than just chanting a slogan and being in the street. The civil rights movement proved that. There was a legal wing of the civil rights movement. And let me tell you this about the civil rights movement. It wasn't black against white. It was black and white and, and other people against white. And when you don't understand that and deal with our history as if that's the history we have, you do yourself a, mis a disservice and you put yourself in a, in a position of having an unwinnable battle. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And I'm gonna say finally by concluding uh, one other thing to all of you, investigate things. Try to refrain from large categorizations because all these all this terminology that's giving you largely is to, is to get into your pocketbook and when you're a kid you're the most exploitable look at what's being sold to you just on your phone think about just the vul vulgarity the pornography the violence the ignorance in video games and stuff designed for kids think about it think about how many acts of violence you've seen and think about how you've seen black people portrayed all the time as some type of criminal whether you're in the hood or not, man, I'm from the hood. Well, every, every black person I saw wasn't shooting nobody. <laughs> that's crazy. But now all of a sudden, that's who we are. Thugs and pimps and all this. Come on, man. You know, so we have a responsibility to, uh, to address the American mythology in a way that does not stereotype us and does not stereotype anyone. And it separates those who are corrupt from those who are not corrupt. You with me? Yes, sir. Thank what you, you play? What do you play? You're a trumpet player. I knew I liked yes, you, man. I was kept thinking, what do you play? You said you're a trumpet player. <laughs> That's it. Well, next time when I see y'all in, in, in person, we get a chance to deal with our horns too. But I think another good thing is don't run from these issues. Police corruption is just like any type of corruption. Don't run from them. It's up to us to correct these things. Thank you. All right. Let's go to yeah. Emma Getzinger. Emma? Hi, I'm Emma Getzinger. I go to Byron Center. I play the baritone saxophone. And I was wondering, how can we come together and be unified as a band without being divisive when the world around us is often so uh, divided? Be different from the world around you. You know, I, I would have some friends who, if, let's say uh, some, some, some friends grew up without a father. And we would be talking and they would say, man, I grew up without a father, so I don't know how to be a father. Another one would say, I grew up without a father, so I'm going to be the best father in the world. 
I call it 360 degree experience. You know, you know the way kids like to say something negative about their parents and always think they're so different from their parents. It's like that's been sold to kids, to younger people, too. You have to be against those people that are supporting you and paying for you. It's, it's, it's asinine. So in the same way you can be against somebody that's supporting you, be against what you see in the world around you. Be in favor of coming together. Say to yourself, hey, these people are not coming together. We're going to come together. You know how they say we have haters? Hey, we have a lot of haters on our team. and We're, we're sports crazy in our country. Well, this team is going to show everybody we're coming together. We're not going to be separated. So counterstate what you see in your nation. You see people not able to listen to other people, you listen. You see people never wanting to sacrifice their point of view, you sacrifice your point of view. You see people always having a solo where you play Barry, so you're automatically a team player. You know, I know baritone saxophone, you gotta, gotta be a team player. So does that make sense, what I'm saying to you? Yeah. You know, exemplify the change you want to see and insist on it, be hard-headed about it. Hey, let's not be like what we see out here. Let's be better than this. My oldest son is 33. And every time I, I gain another pound, he looks at me and says, you're better than this, man. You're better than this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> you're better than this. All right. Uh, let's go to, I'm going to make sure I uh, pronounce your name correctly, Aviel Del Rosario. Uh, hello. Hi. Yeah, you said it. You said it right. That's it. Man, I like that Aviel afro. Rosario. <laughs> Wait, let me let me dap you about your afro, man. I, I've gone bald, so I want you to enjoy your afro while you still can grow one. <laughs> oh man, I appreciate it. Thank you very oh, much. Oh man, I love being a good afro. <laughs> Something I got during quarantine. <laughs> don't don't keep keep up with it. <laughs> My name's Aviel. I'm from Dillard. Uh, I'm 11th grade, going on 12th grade, uh, playing a bass player. <laughs> And uh, after following your career and, uh, and even now just listening to what you're saying, my, my big thing is, is that I want to help. And I just want to know how can we, the younger generation, really connect with uh, well, the older generation uh, and really just tackle these uh, historical problems that, that still plague us today? I think start with your parents. I teach college-age kids. It's always shocking to me how disrespectful they can be to their parents. So I think you start with your parents and, 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 and have an understanding that uh, they have a perspective. Doesn't mean you have to agree with it. You don't have to be disrespectful. Embrace them. This culture tends to make people not embrace their parents. You only embrace their resources. Embrace them. And then I think just to hear you say that you want to create change makes me, makes me almost get full, man. Because uh, it's right in front of us. It's right in front of us, but don't pick low hanging fruit. And the low hanging fruit is all of the divisiveness that's being sold to you all. And remember that the best things that have come about in our country, it's been coalitions of people. Put your coalition together, fight for the changes you wanna see. Get with people of different ages, not just people in your family. You know, know people, extend yourself. Function in an environment that's not exclusive of you and your friends and people who you perceive to be like you. The world is a big place and there are a lot of interesting people in it. There's a lot of bad stuff goes on too. We jazz musicians, right? So we know the, the blues is real. Mm -hmm. But also there are many wonderful and great and wondrous things too. So, you know, what I can tell you, I look forward. Let me see your hands do this. Ooh, you got some claws on you, man. I bet you got a big sound. That's pretty good. You know, you just carry that feeling you got. You want to create change? You want to do something? Create that change. Get with older people. Figure out what's happening. Start in your house. Always start local with the changes you want to see. Be very local. And you can create a lot more change with just your energy than you think. And with the power of that afro, you're going to be all right. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Thank that. you, man. I look forward to boom, 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 hearing that. <laughs> hearing all that right. big sound. We got a picture of you from high school. You got a nice, nice little fro. No, no, let's not show that. Let's... <laughs> uh, let's go to Isaac Sims. Isaac, I think you're from Memphis, right? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. All right. Go ahead, man. Hey, there. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty. 
that's pretty mature, son. That's from quarantine, too. <laughs> I like that. I got to see some ID first. <laughs> um, well, my name is Isaac Sims. Um, I played first center at uh, Memphis Central. And um, I read over your um, essay. And I want to say, uh, within the essay, you, you mentioned also my uh, friend Kylan. He also said uh, you mentioned a conversation with your daughter. Um, and I wanted to ask you, can you elaborate more on how you think the increase of public display of racial, of racial conflict is affecting our newest generation? Like, do you think that the awareness is scaring people or, or do you think that it's really starting to um, gain more awareness in a good way? You know, I think that... Uh anything that brings attention to problems that are real is, is necessary and needed. Okay, so and it doesn't matter what form it's in, who's saying it. I mean, it doesn't have to be the Messiah to say it for it to be true. And the more we all are aware of our own biases or biases that are in, in, in my, my life, I've learned many biases I had. You know, if you're open to learning about yourself and making changes, you don't have to be dramatic about it. Uh, we all think things and we have a worldview. And then as natural as we grow older, hopefully our worldview changes. As a good friend of mine just told me, you open your aperture. You say, okay, this is not quite how I thought it was. Okay, that's, that's the one thing. The second thing is that there are many products that desensitize you. You know, it's what we were talking about earlier. How many acts of murder have you seen just in movies, on films? Stuff designed for kids. How many videos have you seen using the N-word, man, just that alone. I mean, you can put that much trash into a system and say, well, that's different. Take this trash out of the system. We would, that wasn't happening when I was growing up. I mean, it's not necessary for it to be there. We still have racial problems. Now this is the six to seven, but it's like, there's too much trash in the system. It's too much of it. And uh, for younger people, you have to reject that. Now it's hard when you've grown up on that and you think that's culture, man, it's hard to go against that. Populism is very powerful. Somebody has a certain type of shoe, you want that shoe. Even I'm looking at you, it can't be a lot of people with that kind of beard. So I gotta, I gotta give you a commendation. You already are showing me some type of originality. So I think that uh, there's a lot of trash in this system. And, and don't think that the, the kind of awakening of this moment, it's all very slogany. You know, media slogan. We've been through people my age. Hey, we went through the, the we shall overcome <clears throat> the civil rights movement, some disbursement of federal funds, some of which worked, some of which, which was stolen by organizations, black and white. And then there was a reclamation of a type of racism under, the, under another type of term. It's very hard to not return to things that you think have worked for you, white and black. And uh, to create a new world, you have to have a vision of that new world. So that's kind of what I challenge all of our younger generations for. What is your vision of the world? Where does it place people? What's your place in it? Not, not, you know, that's got to be playing. You know, you're, you're playing. So when you, when, you, when you pick your horn up, what do you play? Tenor. Tenor, okay, you said that. Tenor, well, big, tenor, big, big sound, big on, sound on the tenor. When you pick your horn up and you start to play with your colleagues, y'all are doing something productive. All the slogans in the world are not going to make you play that tenor part well. But you're going to have to start finding that lead alto and figuring out how to play. And when you go to solo, you got to, you got to learn some history and you got to know what's going to come out your horn. And you're going to study tenor players and you're going to learn all kinds of things. And all of what you learn in your studies of, 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 of tenor players, you'll learn the whole in the whole American tradition. You're going to learn about Leslie Young and John Coltrane. And you're also going to learn about Stan Getz. And you're going to learn about Joe Lovano. And you're going to learn about tenor players from all over who can all play. And just that consciousness, when you bring that consciousness to the world, then and you're going to go past just slogans. You're going to say, hey, all this stuff was already together. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Hey, good luck with that, with that, with that sound. I like that. Yeah, I'm impressed. I can get it. It, it's impressive. <laughs> Please do that. <laughs> Thank you. Send us pictures. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to go to Sophia.
Sophia <laughs> Davis from Foxborough. I like your poster over your shoulder there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh oh, all right. Now, what's going on, Sophia? Um, nothing much. Just right. um, ask my question. <laughs> yes, indeed, Mr. Massey. You know, Foxborough. That's my man. <laughs> yeah. I, I know he retired, but I still love him with all my heart and soul. Yes. <laughs> So my name's Sophia Davis. I play lead tenor at Foxborough High School. And my question for you is, how do you feel that jazz education, culture, and spirit can become a catalyst for positive change um, outside of the classroom for students? That's a good question. And, and I think, Sophia, it's what we were just talking about. Our music brings people together. When you look at the tradition of, mu of musicians, we're just talking about the tenor saxophone. And you just take this generation of, of, of great tenors. If you take Melissa Aldana and her saxophone playing, and you get it, I don't know if you've heard of her, but I want you to check her out. Melissa Aldana, unbelievable young tenor saxophonist from, from, uh, from Chile. And you take her playing, and you take uh, so many good ones. Who do I, I want to name? Julian Lee, another, I don't know, Julian might be 22 or 23, unbelievable tenor saxophonist. They can really play. And you take Abdias Armenteros, also really can play, also 19, 20 years old. You have a lot of people with a worldview um, that can play, can play your instrument, that are serious about it. And then you're in the context of so many other great musicians who remember, in terms of American race relations and these type of topics, Benny Goodman's concert took place in the mid-1930s. And he was fighting for civil rights at that time. Jazz was integrated before baseball for audiences as for fans. Don't forget about Norman Grant's and jazz at the Philharmonic. And don't forget all that Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, all these people did to make our country be much wiser and more humane and to try to help us grapple uh, with, with, with the history we have. These struggles still continue. The average person does not encounter that because they're being fed a steady diet of commercial trash. So you have to counterstate that and be like, well, that's okay, this is a trash, but look at this right here. Now that doesn't mean everything commercial is trash. Okay, I don't want you to misconstrue what I'm saying. I'm saying many times the most popular is. Counter statement is very important and you will find in this culture, the culture of jazz, a long history and tradition of people who were, represent the deepest part of the soul of this country. They left us a lot of music to play, a lot of concepts. Just an album like John Coltrane's A Love Supreme, Sonny Rollins' Freedom, Freedom Suite. Those are two records you, as a tenor player, you should know those records and check them out. Coltrane, A Love Supreme, Freedom Suite, Sonny Rollins. Does that make sense? Yes, thank give you. My, give my love to Foxborough, Mr. Massey, my man. All right, good luck on your horn, practice that horn. All Practice right. your instrument. Practice your instrument. Uh, let's go to Olivia. Um, I don't know whether her la last name is Dreyfus or if she attends Dreyfus School for the Arts. Olivia? Hi. I go to Dreyfus. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm Olivia. I play um, alto saxophone. And I wanted to ask, um, with the recent anniversary of George Floyd's death, what are your thoughts about some of the negative reactions within the Black community on how swiftly the COVID hate crime bill was passed in the light of um, violence towards Asian Americans, while the George Floyd Policing Act has been at a standstill? Is this frustration within our community valid? Well, I think I don't, I would have to really know what type of union resistance the Asian hate crime bill has, I would have to know, I don't know enough to give you an intelligent answer to know whether it's justified or not. So I'm gonna refrain from doing that. And I'm going to say that um, when people are frustrated in a system like ours, it's, it's important to use every tool available to you to create the changes you want to see. And I, I would like to, and it's, it's important for us, when we want to see change, for us to make change and for us to demand change. For us to demand change of ourselves, Martin Luther King always used to say that. For us to demand change of ourselves and for us to demand change of the system. So I, I wish I really knew. I'm not, I'm not on top of it to give you a good answer. And I don't want to, I, I don't, I don't want to misrepresent it. 
Okay. You know? It's okay. But 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 understand that another thing about the police is that police work for municipalities. So the federal government can pass something, but each municipality has a different, they're the military wing of a city. Their pay mostly comes through the mayor's office. City, the, the, the taxes, they come for the, to, the, to the local police are city taxes. And they work for that municipality. So I always suggest people deal with stuff in their local areas. Sometimes there's a thought that the federal government is going to do everything. It's, it's, it's when the Supreme Court decided not to see the case on a qualified immunity. It's very interesting. In the middle of the whole nation protesting, this was last summer, everybody out in the street, the Supreme Court said, I don't, we don't want to see a thing on qualified immunity, which is a large part of what allows policemen, those who are corrupt, to get by with the things they get by with. Nobody said anything about it. There was not a word. So the Supreme Court could have seen the case and could have said, yeah, you know, we don't qualify immunity as a problem, but it's still something that has to be dealt with locally. I can tell you that. But so far as knowing how to compare the two things, I, I don't know. But I think, once again, I've tried to avoid con conflation. Okay, and conflation is when you having a headache is conflated with you having a chronic heart disease. It's conflated with you stubbing your toe it's conflated with somebody telling you to put the milk in the refrigerator. You see what I'm saying? All, all those things then become, the world is, everything is, don't conflate. Deal with issues separately and try to really ascertain and understand what are the mechanics of these things. And, and to, so if I knew that, I could tell you whether I felt reactions are justified. And always remember that uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not bad to complain. There's nothing wrong with complaining because if you don't complain, nothing is corrected about what's wrong. But for every complaint, always try to have in yourself a positive action that is not a complaint. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right. Let's, let's go to uh, Charles Cherry. Uh oh, see Charles Cherry there. How you doing, Charles? Hey, how are you doing? Um, my name is Charles Terry. I'm an 11th grade trumpet player at Dillard Center for the Arts. And my question is, how do you think the Black struggle affected American culture as a whole, specifically during times like the Civil Rights era, and even after that, like during the 70s? Sure, man. Huh. Well, the Black struggle is written into our Constitution. The Electoral College is based on slave. We had a civil war that killed almost 700,000 people. We had corrupt political dealings to end Reconstruction. We tore up people's communities and we, we our national integrity has been called into question for centuries for how we dealt with people in the land of freedom that were slaves in many ways. It's such a serious subject with so many ramifications on this present moment. When you get to the 60s and 70s, those are decades I can remember. Man, it was, this stuff was far along down the tracks by the time I was born. My great uncle was born in 1883. You had to hear him talk about it. So it is an important part of this country's history. That's why I recommended that book by Christina uh, Proenza Coles. It's a serious subject. It's not, it's not you know, I can... I could, I could tell you it's, it's built into our, the fabric of our nation. And we are, we are a nation that is built on, on ideals with a system that's put around those ideas. A lot of times I, I argue with cab drivers about, about fascism and communism. And I always ask them if they've read the Communist Manifesto. Of course, no, they haven't read it. I say, okay. The Communist Manifesto is a complaint document. It's like the Declaration of Independence. You could not have the United States of America just with the Declaration of Independence. You needed the Virginia plan and then the Constitution. And the Constitution from the Virginia plan was able to put the mechanics of something in place to allow you to fight for grievances, to balance stuff. And the Constitution is designed to create and an, an balance a playing field. It's a very sophisticated document with a lot of balance of power issues. Once you say, well, you know what? 
we don't need to balance power. I'm going to use the Constitution to figure out how I can do what I want to do. The Constitution is not going to help you that much. So I'm saying, giving you this long answer to say, you're a trumpet player, you smart. Jump on really learning about our country and learning about the history of these things. Start with Frederick Douglass. Start with, with Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural. Like there's literature after literature by brilliant people talking about these, these issues. W.B. Du Bois, Black Reconstruction. On and on, I could go to you. And, and, and you, the more you uncover things, you're gonna find white and black Americans, men and women who talked about and continue to talk about these issues in very, very intelligent ways. And as you begin to inform yourself, don't go to just one source, hit many sources. I, I recommend that for all of us because it is a huge national issue that's not just gonna go away. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So, you know, it was for real in the 1960s. <laughs> it was it was certainly for real in the 70s. And it's for real right now. The only difference between us in the 70s and 60s is that we did not have the type of pornography and violence and racism and black stereotyping like y'all have now. We were on our way there with, with the movies about pimps, but all that, I'm, I'm killing black people and using the N-word everywhere and all this imagery of people thugged out and the celebration of that. We didn't have all of that. And we also didn't have the type of of uh, of, of, of just uh, just the way pornography is given to younger people. I, I don't know what kind of strategy it is, but it's not going to work out for us. We did not have that, okay. But uh, but other stuff, ignorance and fighting and acting a fool, we had all of that. <laughs> Racism, we had it. All of that we had. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. I see. So, Thank you. Study. I'm with you. You have a good name, Charles Cherry, CC. Sound like a blues man, old Charles Cherry. Okay, good luck. Practice your horn. Thank you. I don't see a ring around your lips. I'm getting nervous. I got to see more of a ring, man. Your lips look too cute. I, they got to be ugly. <laughs> <laughs> got to look like I look some some owls on that iron. I got to see. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna remember that hours on that iron. That's a good yeah. one. <laughs> Let's go to uh, David Kim, who I think is sitting with his band director. Is that Lisa Lindy sitting with you, Mrs. Lind Ms. Lindy? All uh, right. <laughs> hey, Doug. So, yes, uh, uh, I'm David Kim from Newton South, and I play trumpet. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and He's talking off for you. Uh, my question for you is, what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? That I've ever gotten? Be quiet, son. That's what my daddy told me. <laughs> Can you shut up? <laughs> you see, I didn't learn it well. <laughs> I'm serious. That was the best piece of advice I ever got. Man, can you please shut up? <laughs> you want some other advice? <laughs> I, I'm going to tell, tell you some advice my mama gave me. I, I have a brother that's severely autistic. And uh, we went to a parade. I was maybe, I don't know, 11 or something. My, my little brother was two. My mom was struggling to carry him. So I kept asking her to let me carry him. And you know, autistic kid, at that time, we didn't really know what autism was, but we knew we didn't want him on the ground in a parade. And oh man, I saw it just adjusting him from left to right to left to right. I was like, mama, let me carry him. She just, no, she wouldn't give him to me. Finally, I saw her give one big heave, like when you really, and you know, she want us to catch the balloon and have a good time. And it was too much for me. I said, listen, I can carry this man for such and such amount of time. And she said, look, boy, when I'm carrying some groceries or something, you come help me when I'm doing that. How heavy something is depends on how you feel about carrying it. Mm. So that was good advice. This baby is not heavy. So she wanted to carry him. And she did that for her entire life till she passed. Thank you. All right. Uh Isabella Sadia. Did I say your last name right? Sadia? Sadia? You were close. It's Sagia. Sagia. Okay. Hard G. Sorry. <laughs> yes. uh, so well. my name is Sagia, and I play trumpet at the Tucson Jazz Institute. And you, I was wondering how race issues can be solved that are instigated by or if you have any idea of how race issues can be solved that are instigated by America's current economic system, like healthcare, how African-Americans 
are disproportionately affected by healthcare and the school to prison pipeline and pr police brutality and things like that? You know, once again, this is a very complex issue. Uh, it's an issue that plagues the world. In this case, we talk about Afro-Americans, we can be talking about other groups of people in other places. I think the first thing has to be a uh, changing of the national mythology from these people deserve to be treated this way to we need to try to figure out how this is a large national problem that we all need to try to figure out how to solve. And we need to also place upon them uh, the rights and the responsibilities of helping us solve this problem. Okay, but there has to be a national, the changing of the national, this whole national mythology of, and it's in all the videos and it's all the things like, well, these people are all criminals. They wanna be this, they all, it's, it's all through the 70s, it was all about welfare, right? They're all on welfare. That's not even the mechanics of that don't, don't even go with the prejudice. And now there's just an acceptance of, well, the criminals are all black. Uh, it's very difficult to change these things. It's a national mythology, but we have to change that mythology and replace it with something that is more productive and more accurate. And also with any of our mythologies, we always try to use our best examples. I don't go into people's homes and they pull out the worst pictures in their picture book and say, this is what my family is. Oh, here's when we fought each other. Here's when my daddy, the police came to my house or here's when it is or that. That kind of stuff doesn't happen. You know, for, for us to change our mythology, we have to have somewhat of a dream vision, but it has to include all of us working together and it has to build upon the triumphs of the past without pretending like nothing is wrong. And I don't find it, I, I don't, you're not gonna make as much money off of those things. Like we were saying earlier, if, if I tell you something inflammatory, man, everybody wants to see it. If I talk to you with some respect and answer your question, it's just a, a day at the office. Okay, so I'm gonna leave your, your question just by saying, these are serious things for you all to ponder. I told you all, I have a perspective. I don't have an answer because the problem is too complex for any single person to have an answer to it. It's pervasive, it's longstanding. It is something that, but I do know that the first step toward correcting it is that you want to correct it. That's first, okay, I wanna correct this. The second is, what are we doing productively? What are we doing? What, what are we working on? What are, what, are, what are our cities? What are we working on to bring our populations together? And it's gonna be very difficult for us to do that because we've so willfully segregated stuff for such a long time, but it can be done. All of these things can be done. You know, if you realize how pervas pervasive lynching was in the Southern states, the United States through those, through those early decades up to the 1940s, it, it could happen very easily. Now some happens, but you don't feel like you can just do it and get by with it. And the same thing will be true of police violence. The same thing will be true. Many of the changes we've seen, many of the changes I've seen, they deal with all kinds of things from women in the workforce to, to Hispanics, all, it's all kinds of ways that we make changes. And we need to make those changes. And when you first go to make changes, hey, Sometimes you go too wrong in one direction or some people go too far, so what? Like, we have to make changes. So let's make those, does that make sense, Isabella, what I'm saying to you? Yes, thank you. You know, in the 1960s, there was a, there was a, there was trash on all the highways. And there was a, anybody, Todd, probably anybody old enough will remember, there was a big thing in the nation to pick up litter pick up trash, clean America's highways, pick up the trash. Because the problem was so pervasive, you couldn't get crews to come out and clean it. it. It was on people, pick up trash. And that's how this is. When you see a certain type of behavior, when you behave a certain way, when you think about things, you know, don't sit in judgment of people, you could make that change. When it's time to complain or protest about something, protest. You're American, you have the right to protest and talk about things, but do something productive. Because if you protest and complain, and that's your only, your only, uh, your only method, you, you you will fall into becoming a victim. And then when you're a victim, it can be lucrative. You don't want that to be what you what becomes lucrative for you. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> what what did you say you played? 
I play trumpet. Oh, you see that? Let me see. Where's that? I don't see that ring. I'm, I'm getting nervous about my trumpet players. <laughs> well, y'all, maybe it's some new techniques y'all are using. <laughs> And, you know, Great. I, I don't know they play trumpet. I'm calling on names. So, uh, you know, all these trumpet players are just, you know, much more courageous than uh, the rest of the instruments. Let's go to, uh, and I know I'm going to mess up this name, Amruth, Amroth, Nirajan. Hi, it's, it was Amruth, but yeah, Amruth. it was, thank you. Um, hi, Mr. Marcellus. Uh, I play a trombone at Hall High School. Um, so my question for you today is what specific events in your life led you to release, um, these kind of socially conscious works of yours, such as, uh, blood on the fields, uh, black codes from the under black codes from the underground, um, all rise and more. And how have you developed both artistically and politically through the release of these works? Thank you for that question. Very intelligent question. Well, I grew up with a lot of, uh, in, a, in an extremely volatile, uh, very prejudiced environment. But I also, my, my, my parents were conscious. My mama was conscious, my daddy was conscious. I read all those books, man, in the 60s and 70s that people, you know, my friends wouldn't read, but I was reading them, Soul on Ice. I was into the movement at that time. I wrote my senior paper on slavery. I would always read, like I read Frederick Douglass when I was young in New Orleans. The first thing that awakened me to it, when in New Orleans, we used to have a museum called the Cabildo. And I remember we went to this, this uh, museum of slavery when I was like six or seven years old. And man, they had everything in there, the chains and the way the plantation system worked. It was, and they gave us a, a cartoon book of Frederick Douglass's life. And I read that cartoon. And I only like the one part where Frederick Douglass beat the overseer, Covey up. So, but you know, I was a kid. But after that, I was into just the, the cause. And then it was very one-sided because I was on the black side. So we, everything in, when I grew up was only black or white. It was just how it was, man. What, it wasn't something you questioned on. Then, you know, I told you after King died, well, I had many experiences, man. And, and if I told them to you today, you think, damn, man, y'all dealt with that, y'all dealt with that. But if you were there then, it, didn't, it wasn't that way. That was how life was. And uh, then I became more interested in American things. When I moved to New York, I had a couple of great mentors that didn't think like me. I was coming out of Black nationalism, Black power and all of that. Then I met Albert Murray. He had gone to Tuskegee in the 30s and Ralph Ellison, and they weren't like that. And, and, and Albert Murray, I remember, I was always, you know, man, white people did this to us, white people did this to us. And Albert Murray, who grew up in Alabama in the, in the 19... Teens, he said, Man, you never had a white person help you. I said, Yeah, man, you know, my trumpet teacher. So I started telling him, Man, you know, when I was in sixth grade, my boy John Stewart jumped into this fight. We was having normally math to fight three or four dudes at once. And he said, Man, next time this happened, I'm gonna jump in. And he was the biggest guy. And I thought, Man, I gotta fight you too. He said, No, man, I'm gonna be with you. So, you know, I started telling him these stories. He said, Man, let those stories be a part of your narrative too. That was a turning point for me. Then I was 19, 20 years old. I was still young. And uh, when I started to work on those pieces, Black Codes from the Underground, as I grew, grew, of course, I read more, met more people, learned more. And I had a lot of deep lessons just from being in places. I remember going to Poland and to the Eastern Bloc countries before the commun communism fell. Now, being a Black American from where I was from, man, I thought everything's just American propaganda. Man, you know, these people, man, when I got over there, whew, some people yeah. were living hard, man. I had people my age, 19, 20, hanging out. We went to this one club, man. We were, nobody was on the street. They said, man, you got to come to this club, but you got to be careful. We're not supposed to be in here. And I was hanging out with college students. Man, they kept me up all night talking about America and this, and we were playing in Poland. And they said, man, you do not, this stuff is not a joke. You know, it's not. And then I thought, okay. I was so convinced it wasn't true because it was in the media, this and that. And, you know, as you grow older, hey, your perspective broadens. So yeah, with each work, each thing I do, I go back to American rights and freedoms and my 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 view is more expansive and I open my aperture more to include right. more things because I'm more grown. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that then makes sense. another thing that happens to all of you as you grow older, if you're honest with yourself, all of the dumb stuff you're going to do to yourself is going to make you be much humbler in your opinion about other people. Definitely. You know, because when you start your own roll call, you're going to be like. 
<laughs> right. What was I thinking when I did that? You know, what was I, oh my God, how did I do all this stupidity? You're gonna commit so many crimes against yourself that you become much more uh, understanding. And mm -hmm. I also have just deep my understanding of, of America. In that time, I traveled all up and down the country, went to schools everywhere, talked to people, parents and kids. I had 40 years of doing that. And just the education of all those years and nights with people and their kids in different places, it's education in that. Yeah. I Thank hope you. I answered your question. That's a good yeah, you question. Yeah, definitely did. Thank you, sir. I like your name, too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Emma Lacey. Emma? Hey. Hello, my name is Emma Lacey, and I play lead alto saxophone and solo clarinet in the Foxborough High School Jazz Ensemble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Marsalis and everyone at Jazz Lincoln Center for a fantastic festival. I'm really excited and grateful to be here. Um, my question also relates to your blog post following the murder of George Floyd and especially its relationship to systemic discrimination in the United States. I found it very powerful and after reading it, I'm wondering how as students and young people, we can get involved in the fight against systemic discrimination, either through music or otherwise, and especially coming from a small suburban town with little diversity. That's a great question. You know, I think that uh, the, the first thing you can do is understand our local problems in the, in the broader context of the world. First, just, just place it in that broader context. That when you fight for human freedoms anywhere, you're fighting for them everywhere. And then understand that you will be much more knowledgeable about problems that exist in your local area. Now, I mean, I've been to Foxborough, so I understand what you're saying. But at least y'all's team is not winning now. So that makes everybody feel much better about y'all. Okay, Sorry. I want to say that. I have to applaud for that one. <laughs> and, I, and I want to say that you have to understand that these, these are human issues that are deep. And it's, it just goes with what I've been telling you the, the entire time. And it, uh, don't think that the, the civil rights workers of all races weren't having a good time, laughing sometimes when they dealt with issues. You can see all kinds of photos of Andrew Young and King and them, man, they having a good time. And then they're saying, we want to see this type of change in our country. My father once told me that when Lyndon Johnson became president, he thought, well, there goes civil rights. That was the person that signed all the civil rights legislation. He thought, man, this guy from Texas, <laughs> you're not, no chance. So I'm saying, I'm giving you that broad example to say that look, look at where you feel you can make a difference and make that difference because every little thing makes a difference. So I'm gonna go back to my analogy of how we have to pick up trash. Everything will help. These problems are so pervasive and don't, don't think of them as white versus black. They're black and white versus the concept of white and the concept of black. Once I was stopped by a police officer driving through Texas, man, it was late at night. We were definitely speeding. I mean, it's like one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. Me and my, my man, Frank Stewart, we, we've driven all up and down the country because I'm afraid to fly. So I will literally drive 40 hours to get to a gig. And the, 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 the officer stopped his younger. So maybe at that time I was maybe 47 or 48 and he was maybe 27, 20, you know, so we had like a kind of the father son type of age. So he put the light on in the car. He said, you know, you know, you all were doing this. Now Frank is older than me. So he said, we know. So he looked at me and he said, he said, he said, what, he didn't say what race are y'all. He said, what are y'all? Okay. And I told him we are Americans. And he looked at me and he laughed. He said, <laughs> he said, Americans. And then he threw Frank's driver's license back to him. And he said, okay, Americans. Now, what did he mean by that? I have no idea. You know, But it was something about that to him was like, man, you know, and I've been stopped many times by police officers. I was never shot because I always act like when I'm stopped that these are some dudes in my neighborhood with guns. <laughs> now, it's a shame you have to act like that with your, with your, with your, your sanctioned violence group. But I told y'all I'm from the, from the neighborhood. So I'm gonna do all I can to survive an encounter. And I will tell you one other story just local stories. Once uh, some cops stopped me, I was trying to pick my daddy up and they stopped me and, and, and he, they thought I was selling drugs, but I was driving on a permit. So I wasn't supposed to be driving. 
And I started immediately talking to the dude, like I started mouthing, you know, I started to speak to him a certain way. So by the time I was dropping my father, my father went to his car and he saw I was apprehended by the officer and he came up. Yeah, so <laughs> he came up and heard what I was saying. He was just looking at me like, man, this dude is <laughs> so. So a guy who was the police officer in the club, my father just finished playing, went by and he asked the officer to do him a favor and let me go. He said, man, just let this guy go. So the officer said, I'm not letting him go unless, until he apologizes to me. So I looked at my daddy, I said, man, I'm not apologizing to him. So my father looked at me and he said, man, you're dumber than I thought you were. <laughs> do you want to spend a night in jail? So I'm not saying any of that to make light or make fun of the very serious uh, problem we have in our country with policing. But I just say it to say once again, do we have a problem with corruption? And if you take the average police stops, just on the average citizens that go on, a lot of those stops, they don't end in violence. And a lot of the citizens are white citizens who had a beer open in the hallway, was driving a bike without a, lot, without a light on. And when they get down to the station, you know what they have to do? Pay $200, $300, $400 to this. A lot of stuff has scam underneath. So I want you, Emma, I want you to always look at stuff and, and do what you can to fight the underlying corruption and things. And that exists everywhere, even in Foxborough. And practice that clarinet. <laughs> Thank you very you much, sir. Play a lot of clarinet. If they pull you over, you can play, pull your horn out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I saw him uh, stroking his beard. Harrison uh, Gesser, Jesser? How do you say your last name, Harrison? Uh, you have Gesser. a good beard there. It, it's Gesser. Gesser. Thank you. Um, my question was specifically, uh, do you think that uh, uh, black Americans were struggling more with class or with a, a, an American uh, nationality and or like cultural assimilation that the government might have been pushing on them at the time? And how does I can't I, I can't understand the end of your question. You said with class and then something else. I was saying, do, do you think black Americans were struggling more with class or with um uh, American nationality and or a cultural assimilation and how does that struggle relate to jazz like viewing it also from a class and cultural perspective and not just a racial perspective so that's my question when you say were what do you mean well, excuse me when you say were what do you, what do you mean are now yeah, or were well I when I said were I mean in your experience growing up in in also the 60s and the 70s when prejudice was re really high as well pre pre you know I what, what were we struggling with? Okay. Once again, I'm from the South. I'm from Louisiana. I have a, a particular experience to me. It does not apply to Black Americans. Depending on where you're from, who you are, what you experience, what you, you experience different things. Now, from the standpoint of my area, I mean, no, I mean, the white people didn't even have anything where I was, where I was, so. Class was, was a very small part of it. Me and my younger brother, Ellis, always argue about class versus race. And his, his thing is always his class, his class, his class. Class is a problem in America that has other ramifications. I don't want to conflate those things. Cultural assimilation, how, it's difficult to, to assimilate your own culture, especially when what you're assimilating into is imitating a lot of you. Now there's also the thing about a culture in America there's a whole culture in America that is inviting and has a great deal of warmth for, for all types of Americans. But there's a lot of the culture that's anti-Black people. For example, the king of rock and roll had to be someone white, even though he grew up on the Black side of Tupelo, Mississippi. So if you're a Black person and you want to be the king of rock and roll, man, you know, you can't be that. Even if the king of rock and roll is imitating you. So you have an adversarial relationship to what your place is in the, in the cultural hierarchy. And uh, in my time, I think I've seen things I thought I would never see in this country, like the ascendance of Michael Jordan as an athletic figure like Babe Ruth. You didn't think that was possible in my time. Or um, other things that happen in our culture at the top of it. So you see a different kind of top. But one thing you also saw was the fact that M Americans would entertain themselves with, with extremely destructive black stereotypes. Man, I mean, it, for, for somebody my age, man, I played 
I played in a funk band in high school. I played thousands of dances of people hugging their girlfriends, significant others, singing love songs. Man, this stuff that's coming out now, <laughs> it's been coming out for 30, 25 years. And we can't, from somebody like me, it's like, man, y'all would rather say this to them than that? Damn, we don't understand it. I mean, I, I, and I listen to it and I still can't under, quite understand that. So I think that, uh, you know, the cultural issue is one, it's a very complex issue. What is American culture without the Afro-American? Man, you're gonna have a hard time figuring out what that is. What is American food? What is this? What is, what, what is music? What is our way of speaking? What is our language? So we have a stake in American culture that's larger than our minority number. So far as we, it's even hard to say, who is we? You can go back into the 18th century, Stephen Foster's songs, they were popular songs. They come right from spirituals and slave songs and minstrel songs. So all of that stuff is, study the minstrel show and you'll see how many layers there are in American culture. Class, no matter where you are, when people have something, they have an advantage over people who don't have it. However, if you look at, I'm in Tulsa now, and you look at all of those riots that took place starting with Memphis in the 1880s, New Orleans in 1900, then all of the riots that took place, East St. Louis, uh, uh, Rosewood, there's, there's plenty of cities where black people had some degree of affluence and they were just wiped out in a couple of days. And, and in Memphis, it took place over a long period of time you get to understand it, you know, class is, it's, it's, uh, you can, you can have something, but you can still be subject to another set of, uh, of rules and laws. So, so, but, but once again, to reiterate what I've been saying this whole time, there is no simple way to address these issues, except to address them, to study them, to develop your perspective on different parts of them, because it's so deep and pervasive. Anywhere you look, you're going to see it. And it's there. The question is, are you looking at it? And when you look at it, the thing I always write in my music is look at it. Can you see me? Keep looking at it. And you will come up with solutions for it. Thank you. Uh, can I just ask, what did you mean when you said, what did, what did you exactly mean when you said cultural hierarchy? Uh, when you, Co cultural what? Cultural hierarchy. You said that when you were um, answering. Yeah, that's, that's from what is heroic to what is frowned upon. That's the cultural hierarchy. Like in, in, in culture, let's let's just think. And, and well, there was a time that American, America had intellectuals, like someone like Hemingway was respected. Now people don't really know those kind of people, but there's, they're graded now. I guess younger people graded by how many views they get or likes. I mean, I was talking to young people that was referring to some kind of something on Spotify. It is, I don't really know what that is because I'm not a social media, Say I don't really care how many people like something. So it's hard for me to, but it's like uh, the most sales is up here in the hierarchy. It's the most influential. But then you end up getting something like, you know, I, I'm not even going to say anybody's name, but <laughs> man, I have a friend that calls me and she, she tries to get me to guess how many uh, listens so-and-so has on this or that. How close can you come? Well, the Beatles, if the Beatles are 26 million, who has 65 million or who has, you know, 70? And I, <laughs> as we go up the hierarchical chain, I immediately reduce the, the level of the music and I go up in my pornographic content, you know? So, so I, I can get, so what I mean by the cultural hierarchy is who's occupying the prime real estate in the culture in ter terms of determining how people think and feel and understand what it means to be themselves. Does that make sense? I can't oh, hear you. Sorry, yes, it does. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna have to get your ID, man. You're very mature looking. You're not in high school. We're gonna start doing blood tests for Essentia Ellington. So uh, we're we're about out of time here. We've gone a little over. I want to get one last question in. Uh, Aiden Trio, uh, who uh, I know loves Duke Ellington and loves uh, Harry Carney. He is always sending me, you know, swinging tunes to listen to. Uh, Aiden. Okay. We can't hear you, Aiden. Can you unplug your headphones? Are they unplugged into your computer? 
Yeah, we can't hear you, Aiden, at all. Okay. How about now? There we go. There we go. There you go. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Aiden Trujillo. I'm with the Tucson Jazz Institute. Um, my question for you, Winton, uh, was how can we as musicians bring more uh, of the Black audience back to uh, what, what some call the jazz music? <laughs> <laughs> that's the hardest question I've been asked all day. Because <laughs> I've noticed like just throughout just throughout my childhood and recently throughout high school, I've, it, people always like groaned at the, the just the mention of jazz and they always associate it with freeform stuff that doesn't sound good or whatever. Man. <laughs> like, no one thinks of like Strayhorn or Ellington anymore. Listen. That. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, if you, I may be a really old man and you might fit, solve that problem. I'm putting that to you now. And when I'm on my deathbed and I can barely hear, I want you to come visit me wherever I am and bend down over the bed and whisper into my ear the answer to that. Now, if I knew the answer to that, man, I'd be like, uh, I think, let's, I, but I'm, I'll tell you how I try to make sense of it. Because of course, none of my friends I grew up with knew about the music or like it. Did even even though we were from outside in New Orleans, they didn't know the name of one jazz musician, New Louis Armstrong. They didn't know what he sounded like, knew his name. Now that was then. So I'm sure it's less now. But I want I'm gonna pose it to you. If you have a group that is that is rewarded for denigrating themselves and putting themselves down and making a fool of themselves, man, how are they gonna embrace something that does the opposite of that? Just like they're masters, they're slaves. My dad used to ever say, he said, man, if you get somebody used to going through the back door, they'll build a back door to go through. And he used to yeah. always hate when we would sit in the back of the bus because we never wanted to sit in the front of the bus. Man, people got hit in their heads for y'all to sit in the front of the bus. Don't go sit in the back, sit in the front. So, you know, it's a complex problem. Once again, like all of these problems. Because the, the thing about music is this. Music is like the warhead that the most trash is being sent into the culture on. And black folks are some of the deepest and greatest victims of, and in a way it's an ironic kind of joke. Man, these people create all this great music and they're now a trash can. <laughs> so you have to almost laugh at the absurdity of it. But when you have something that is being, that the trash is being delivered on, your sensitivity to it decreases. Now let's think about all the cultural arts. Man, you, can you take some kids to a museum and? You know, they'll run around and look at some stuff for an hour. Yeah. You know, this is this. You walk past some art and you have a lot of spacious room. And then you get in your bus and you go, you get with your parents, you go home. You can do that. But now let's talk about classical music or jazz. Man, you got to go out. You got tickets are expensive. Then you got to sit for two hours of some music you don't like. <laughs> and your kids are jumping around and running around and doing this. They, you're not going to take them to that. And that's jazz and classical music. And then you could couple with that that you as a parent, the music you like does not have development sections. Your musical heroes couldn't necessarily play. They were either the cute person or somebody who's reminding you of high school. We need a higher level of education in our country. This is an education problem. And it's how you start. You take the first education was, arts education was dismantled in America after the Great Depression. Man, that's the 1930s. Then, after when you when you get to Sputnik, that was math and science. The Russians beat us to space. Don't worry about any type of music. Then jazz education never got started. So you have a lot of work for all of y'all to do with just educating people in a painless way about this music. And if you could get a generation or two educated about something into listening, then you'll start to see change. But as long as people being exploited commercially. And I can make these products, man, with all this cursing and all this ignorance on it, people with no clothes on. Come whisper to me on my deathbed, this is what I found out. You might say, I don't know, man. Good luck. Hey, thank you so much, Wynn. Uh, hey, man, thank I, you. I will, I will definitely be there. If I, if I make it happen, I'll, I'll, I'll try my well, best to make it happen. Even if you don't, don't make it happen, come see me at least. I will, definitely. <laughs> All right. So, folks, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, we're a little after our time. 
Uh, Winton, do you have any closing words before uh, we send everybody off tonight? I just want to say I'm glad to see everybody. I want to congratulate y'all for your playing. I want you to understand that, that the life of our country is always serious, and we're artists. And if you're artists, you need to be involved in your nation's mythology and facts about your nation, and you need to be involved and always going toward the most adult type of sensibility. Things are sophisticated, they're complicated. There's a lot of lying and subterfuge, and there's a lot of truth. You have to dig to find what's real. And I encourage all of y'all to be productive with each other. Get online, meet other people, people you don't know. You're more connected than, than, than any generation has ever been. Use that connectivity to do something productive and have respect for your parents. That's the last thing I'm going to tell y'all. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you for that, Winton. I hope my kids were listening to that last bit there as well. <laughs> it's too late. It's too late for you, man. Too Me late. and you, we do it too late. <laughs> All right, y'all. Love and respect. All right. So, folks, I uh, want to remind everyone the Jam Session video premieres at 730 tonight. Uh, some amazing playing in there. Make sure you check that out. And uh, we'll see everybody uh, tomorrow for some more events and then Saturday uh, the uh, virtual performances. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, band directors. Thank you, students. Thank you, families and parents. Uh, we'll see you all later.